In this chapter that we have been looking at for the last few weeks, uh, James addresses three consequences. Three consequences of being self-centered or self-focused or maybe another way of putting it, James addresses three consequences when we seek our own will over God's will. The, the first consequence we looked at a few weeks ago is, is when we seek our own way, it, it, it can sometimes lead us to initiate fighting and quarreling with other people. People and specifically in the context of who James is writing to, he's talking about fighting and quarreling that can happen within the church family, within the body of Christ. And, and, and James says the reason why we initiate this, this fighting among us and this quarreling among us is because there's something that we want. That's the starting point. There's something that we want. And, and it can be a good thing. I mean, it can be a good thing that we want we're within the church family. James says there's something that we want, but for some reason, there is something or someone that is not enabling us to have what we want. And James says, out of our own selfish desires, we then move into a place in which we begin to attack. We begin to fight. We begin to quarrel. We begin to bitter because this thing that we wanted that was a good thing maybe in our life it has now moved into a demand I must have this and then out of our own selfishness out of our own sinful pride we move into a place that says it doesn't matter if I have to hurt a relationship. It doesn't matter if I have to hurt a church. It doesn't matter if I have to tear down people. I want what I want. That's the first consequence when we seek our will over God's will. The, the second consequence James writes about is what we looked at last week. Is, is that when we have a self-centered view of ourselves... What can happen sometimes is we can develop a judgmental view of others. And that judgmental view can, can lead us now to condemn others. I cannot believe they did that. I cannot believe they would say that. And it's moved our heart now to condemn them, tear them down, instead of seeking to build up when we see that someone is down or, or seeking to understand when, when, when maybe we don't understand a decision that someone has made or maybe we just might even feel like we're misinformed. In, in, instead of desiring empathy for someone, instead of wanting to reconcile with someone, instead of desiring to heal someone, to restore someone, what happens is out of our own selfishness, we put ourselves in the position of judge and jury and executioner. What happens is we end up playing the role of God in someone else's life. That's the third consequence James writes about. And then the third consequence that we're going to look at today is that when we choose our own will, we begin to plan our life. We begin to determine the future of our life. We just simply begin to live our everyday life based on our own desires, on our own wants, on whatever it is that we think we want to do. We begin to build a life based on what we want with ever asking God, God, what is it that you want here? In this situation, in this circumstance, in this relationship, what is it that you want here? And once again, we put ourselves in the position of God over our own life. And so this is the third consequence we're going to look at this morning as we conclude James chapter 4. And so would you read with me James chapter 4 beginning in verse 13. James writes these words, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? 
for you are a mist that appears for a little time, then vanishes. And so James gives us this scenario of a merchant making plans for the upcoming year. And this person decides to find a town or a city in which they'll spend a year selling or trading their merchandise or their goods with the intent of making money. Now, of course, there is nothing wrong with making this type of plan. I mean, there's nothing wrong with establishing a business plan. There's nothing wrong with even making money. There's nothing wrong with sitting down and thinking and planning for the future. But the point that James is making here is too often we make these plans without even having that moment, having that season in which we go before God and we say, God, what is it that you want of me? God, I I have this business. This is what I'm thinking about. God, this is my family. This is what I'm thinking about. God, I have this interest over here. This is what I'm thinking about. But, But God, what is it that you desire? James could have used any scenario here in verse 13. He could have said, come now. You who say, I'm going to go to college at this school and get this degree. Come now, you who say, after I graduate, I'm going to move to this city and have this type of career. Come now, you say, I'm going to marry this person. We're going to have this many kids. Come now, you who say, this year I'm going to be involved in this activity and our kids are going to be doing these activities and this summer we're going on this vacation. Come now, you who say, I'm going to serve in this ministry and I'm going to use my gifts in this way. James could have used any scenario in which we are making plans for the future and determining what we would like to do with our life. I bet right now you have some type of plans that you're thinking about. Maybe they're the plans for the rest of this afternoon, the rest of this week. Maybe they're summer plans. You're trying to get, maybe you're trying to figure out, okay, what does it look like for, for me this summer? What does it look like for our family this summer? Maybe you're in the season and you're making five-year plans, ten-year plans. And as I mentioned, there's nothing wrong about thinking about the future. There's nothing wrong with planning for the future, establishing goals that you're going to be working toward, that you're going to be saving for, that you're planning for. There is great, great wisdom in doing that. The issue that James is addressing is that we determine, that when we determine our life, and and, and when we determine our goals, and, and and, and we pursue all of these things that we want to do outside of the leaning and the direction and the conviction and the will of God. See, too oftentimes we, we think of our life simply within the finite nature of our existence in this temporary world. In verse 13, the end goal for the merchant was making a profit. And again, there's nothing wrong with making a profit. There's nothing wrong with having goals, but James wants us to think about our end goals according to the work and the will of God. God may have plans for that merchant. And and, and they may have been through this business plan that he's making. That the plans itself were not contrary to God's will, but maybe God had some bigger things that he was wanting to do with that merchant as he went into that year or as he thought about the money that he's making, that that man is thinking about that business plan from an eternal perspective. One writer said, these merchants did well to look into the future, but they did not look far enough. We must look into the future in terms of eternity, not only in terms of tomorrow's gain. Their aspirations were high, but they were not high enough. I really appreciate those words. You want to think about the future? Are you a future thinker? Are you a planner? That is a great thing. But think about those plans in light of eternity. You want to accomplish something with your life? That's a good thing. But think about those accomplishments through the lens of what God wants to accomplish in you for the sake of the kingdom of God. How is it that God wants to use your time right now? We all, by the way, 
have the same amount of time. We're just using it differently. How is it that God wants to use your energy right now? Your life right now for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the sake of the glory of God. In, in verse 13, the issue James has isn't with planning. It's with presumption. The, the presumption says, I'm going to be given a year. And I'm going to be given health. And I'm going to be able to travel to this city. The presumption is, I'm going to be able to do whatever it is that I want to do. That there's this idea that I am in control of my life. And through planning and hard work, this is what life will be. And James says, no one can presume anything when it comes to their life. This is why verse 14 says, You do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. But by saying that our earthly life is a mist, he's wanting us to think about our current existence through the reality that we're finite beings. And we have limited days. That we have a brief amount of time here. And that that should shape how we live. Psalm 90 12 says, teach us to number our days so that we might get a heart of wisdom. In other words, teach us to see how short life is so that we would live each day, each week, each month, each year wisely. Now, what does, what does that mean to live wisely? Or what does that mean to have a heart of wisdom? Well, it means that, that we recognize that our lives are to be used by God in a manner that recognizes that we exist for the purposes of God. That we're not just existing here out of our own earthly foolishness, chasing our own earthly wants, but, but we're living it out of a godly wisdom that views life out of the reality of of eternity, out of the reality that you and I were created as believers in Jesus Christ for the kingdom of God. You know, when we place our faith in Christ, we surrender our life to Him, we become a new creation, and Scripture says that our lives are now no longer our own. We used to be a slave to sin. Which is ironic, our life really was never our own. It was either a slave to sin and death, or now it belongs to Christ. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. What Paul is saying is your physical bodies, your physical lives, they're not yours to do with whatever you please. They belong to God for his purposes. And and Paul writes these wonderful words in Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ, the owner, the author of my new salvation. It is Christ who lives in me. And so James wants us to think that, that if this life is short and we have a limited amount of time and our lives are not our own, then the question must be for us as believers in Jesus Christ, God, what do you want me to do with my life? And that's not just a one-time question. It's not even an annual question. It's not an every now and then question, but it's a daily question. God, what do you want to do with my day, with my hour, with my minute? And so in verse 15, James writes about how we should approach life. How we should approach our short-term plans and how we should approach our long-term plans. And so he writes these words in, in uh, verse 15. He said, instead, okay, now he's going to give us the alternative. This is how you should live. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. What James is saying is that we should live our life out of a response to something. Our life, everything, we should, or everything that we're doing, it's out of a response to something. What's that response? It's out of a response of what we see God leading us to do. And, and, and so James is saying that the merchant in verse 13 could say, let's go to the city and trade and make a profit if he knows that's his place of obedience. 
this is the place that this is what God has placed upon me and I am doing this not because I want the profit not because I want to spend the year here I'm doing this out of response of what God is calling me to do if the Lord wills dot 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 now the challenge is, if you're going to live according to the will of God, then what do you need to know? Well, the will of God. What is it that God wills, desires for your life? And of course, this is one of the great struggles that many Christians have. Well, how do I know God's will? I mean, sometimes discerning God's will can feel like this mystery. God, what, what, I, I, I can't hear you. God, what, what do you want me to do? And, and sometimes it can just feel frustrating and defeating, trying to understand clearly, God, what, what do you want me to do in this situation? And I, I, I think the idea of knowing God's will becomes frustrating, sometimes defeating. When we look at his will as looking for God to give us precise directions. God, you want me to go left here? Do you want me to go right here? And, and in that spot, we find ourselves paralyzed. I, God, I, I don't know. I can't seem to hear clearly. Do you want me to go left or right? I believe that knowing God's will in our everyday life is less about precise directions and more about ongoing, intimate fellowship. As I walk through life, I, I am in this ongoing relationship with God. And that ongoing relationship then shapes everything I do. And it shapes my thoughts and my desires. It shapes how I treat my wife. It shapes how I treat my kids. It shapes how I approach my work. It shapes how I, I, how, how I, how I think about my community around me. I think Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which, which is one of my favorite verses gives us a great picture of this living out God's will in, in our everyday lives. Solomon, King Solomon, who scripture says was the wisest man to ever live, he was the son of King David. And, and, and Solomon is now writing words to his own son. And so when we come to Proverbs 3, we see Solomon's words to his son for the benefit of his son. And, and he says this, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And so Solomon is saying to his boys, when it comes to knowing the will of God, here is your responsibility. Here's my responsibility. It begins by fully and completely trusting in him. In all, in all that you do, and I can, I can sound like just kind of cliche words, but, but he says that, that's the starting point. You trust him, son. You trust him as the one who is the provider of your life, the sustainer of your life. You trust him as the one who will lead you and guide you and guard you and protect you and satisfy you. You trust him as the one who knows what is good for you. I think it's so easy to lean and trust our own instincts, our own wisdom, our own understandings outside of God. We get nervous. We get nervous that maybe God doesn't really know what is good, or we get nervous that maybe God's not really going to show up. It, and Solomon's telling his son, God can be trusted. You, you turn your life over to him. The reality is many of us do not trust God because many of us do not truly believe that he will lead and direct our lives in a way that is good. And so we, 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 we kind of keep one hand on the wheel. Just, God, I, I, I'm, I no, you're God and I know you're God and you're finite and you're great and, and God, I'm, I am all for you, but this is just the area I got to hold on to. I, ju I just have to hold on to it because I... I, you know, I, yes, I know you're going to come through. I just, hey, listen, I'm just, I'm just a backup maybe. Why don't you just see me as a backup here? Solomon continues and says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. 
this is not about living our own life, but recognizing there's a God. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm, I believe in God. I believe in the Son. I place my faith in Him, but I'm just going to be living my life. And there will be times that I will tip my hat up there. I'm going to turn to Him. I'm going to cry out to Him. But that's not what this is saying. He's not saying in all your ways, just, just kind of recognize there's a God. This says in all of your ways, live as if there is a God. And that he is a way that he wants you to live. That, that phrase, acknowledge him, literally means to know him or more precisely, submit to him, surrender to him. And so we're to live life in which we say, God, I know how you want me to live according to your word when it comes to my marriage. And so God, I just, I just give you my marriage. I'm trusting you with my marriage. God, I know how you want me to live when it comes to my neighbors, the people around me, my job. And so, God, I just surrender. I submit all those things to you. You know, it is so easy to live a life as a believer in Jesus Christ, not out of a surrendered heart before God. Even though I think we never say, I'm not living a life out of surrendered heart. That, that's not surrendered to him, but it's so easy not to live out of a surrendered heart, but simply out of a surrendered calendar or a surrender schedule that just keeps us going Monday through Monday from January to January. You know, this season of life, our family, has just felt like a particularly busy season. Um, it just feels like over the last couple of weeks, um, you know, our, our calendar's kind of full, just kind of going from one activity to another activity. A lot of my wife and I's conversation is, okay, I'm picking him up here, right? You're going to get him because I'm, I'm over here, but make sure you're there. And I'm like, no, I'm going to be there. And, and it feels like that's where a lot of our life has been. And in that busyness, you know, I, I have found myself saying, God, was this your schedule? God, God are, are we living this life out of obedience to you? I mean, is, is this what you, you wanted? I mean, if, if this is what you wanted, man, I'm all in. I'm happy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to do it. But I just, I just, it's easy to find yourself in some schedule when you go, God, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if maybe, maybe this just kind of happened because life happens. Is, is this the time? Is this where you want us to spend your time? Is, is this where you want us to spend our energy as a family? Because I had this little nagging feeling that this didn't come out of prayerful commitment to you. I feel like this came because we decided at one point, yes, that's good for them to do. And yes, that's good for them to do. And okay, no, yes, I'll say yes to that commitment. My wife says, yes, I'll say this to that commitment. And next thing you know, I don't think we're living a life out of the will of God. I just think we're living a life driven by a schedule. And that schedule is consuming our time and our energy in our relationships. How often are we truly sitting down with our family schedule and saying, okay, God, this is the summer. What do you want? What, 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 do, you, what do you want? We have limited time each day and we have limit, limited days each week, and we live limited months each year, and so we recognize our lives are not our own. You bought it at the cross. You bought it. My life belongs to you. So, so we exist for you. Our lives are not our own. And so God, show us where we need to say no, and show us where we need to say yes. So we're not just operating out of our own calendar and schedule, but we're operating out of people who are walking in obedience to you. So that we can honestly say, in the business of it all, this is your will. And we eagerly and we joyfully walk in your will. I'm not, I'm not going to speak for you, so I'll only speak for me. I won't even speak for my wife. But if I'm honest, I think sometimes as a dad, and in my own life, in my married life, in my family life, that sometimes I don't bring God something because I think maybe he's going to desire something else. Maybe I don't lay down that week-long vacation that I just want. And I don't say, God, is this what you want? Is, is, this, is, is this your will for me, my marriage, my family? Because out of my own selfishness, I actually begin to think, God, 
isn't truly good. Because maybe you want something different. And what I have to recognize in those moments is that I have to say, God, I think what is good, I think I know what is good more than you know what is good. By the way, when we bring our lives before God and our schedules before God and our everything before God, I don't think necessarily it means that he will change all those things, but it may change how we think about those things. Okay, God, you want us to go on this week-long vacation, but oh, God, you, you, you want us to have a heart that says, all right, we're going to be on the road and we're going to be in hotels and we're going to be with family and we're going to be with strangers. God, give us a missional mindset this week. May we gather as families and be praying every day. Oh God, show us in the midst of this rest, in the midst of this wonderful place you've given us. God, give us mission here. That could be what he just wants us to do. But we have to trust that God is good and his plans are good. This is why Solomon says at, at, the, at, at the end of Proverbs 3, um, 5 and 6, he says when we trust him fully and we some but when we submit to him, he is going to make our path straight. Now, a straight path doesn't mean an easy path. A straight path doesn't mean a pain-free path. But it's a path in which we know the goodness of God. And so when we talk about knowing God's will, as James writes about in chapter 4, it's a life in which we are trusting in God and surrendered to God in everything we do because we know God is good. And we just are trusting in everything. We're living a life not of asking God to make known every left and right, but we're living life in intimate fellowship with him so that as we walk through life, he begins to place things in our hearts. Hey, I, I want you to reach out to this person, call this person, encourage this person. He, he begins to place convictions in our heart. Hey, I, I want you to enter into this ministry, into this activity. I want you to pursue this opportunity. You, you, you just begin to discern that God begins you, gives you these desires that are according to his will. Oh, Jeff, I want you to start to use your time over here. I want you to use your finances over here. I want you to use your time in this manner. And you just begin as you walk in fellowship with God that he's just leading you and directing you. And we begin to live this way, we find ourselves less and less stuck in those major crossroads of saying, what's my will? But we just delight in walking in daily fellowship with God. And so James writes, we're to say, if the Lord wills, oh God, if this is your desire, then we'll do this, we'll do that. James knew that many of his readers were not living this way. That they were acknowledging God as God, but then simply building their own life and even just boasting of the things that they're doing. And so James writes this in verse 16. As it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. James says that your boasting and your confidence in your own plans and your own self, it's evil. Man, that, that's, a, that's a hard word, evil. It's evil because we placed ourselves as God over him. That we've said, hey, I'm making my plans and I am working my own plans. Opposed to saying, God, I, I'm creation, you're creator. I belong to you. My life is because of what your son has done for me. My life is not my own. So God, I just, here are my plans and I, and I bring them to you. I think sometimes we can find ourselves building a life and we're saying, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And, and hey, this is what we're doing as a couple. This is what we're doing as a family. And there's a sense of pride in that. And it can be good things you're doing. There can be a sense of accomplishment in what we're doing. And, and yet, you never actually actually stop to say, God, is this what you want for us? And sometimes we can end up building a life and being proud of a life, boasting of a life that God never wanted for us. Or maybe we were doing the right activities out of the wrong desire, the wrong motives. He had kingdom work in those activities and we just view them as activities. James concludes in verse 17 with these words. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. 
when we read these words, I, I don't think that James is simply responding to this previous paragraph of living your life according to the will of God. R rather, I, I believe that verse 17, in fact, some of, your, some of your translations may make that a new paragraph. There's an indention there because the translators recognize that this is a statement that now loops back to all of chapter 4. That, that, that James is now addressing all of the areas that he has just talked about. Things that we want but we can't have. The words that we speak to one another. The plans that we're making in our life. And he's saying, as you seek God in these areas, he will make it clear as you seek him what is good in these areas. He will make it clear how you are to respond in a way that pleases him. And I think in many of these areas, it doesn't really require a lot of discernment because he's already made that clear in his word. He's saying, as you seek him, you will know what is right. When God is prompting you to do what he is calling you to do in these areas and all the areas, don't, don't ignore it. I, I, I imagine we've all had those moments where we, we clearly just sense the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our life. A prompting that says, hey, Jeff, don't speak right now. Just listen. Or a prompting that says, hey, Jeff, don't, don't make your case. Just ask for forgiveness. Or a prompting that says, just encourage it right now. Or uh, if you're like me, you've had this prompting many times. Jeff, just pray with your wife right now. Just pray with her. That's what she needs. Or maybe it's a prompting that says, everyone else is in these activities, and yet I'm just feeling for our family, we should be over here. And God, that's hard because everyone else is doing this, and I feel like we're going to be missing out, and my kids are going to be missing out, and I'm going to be missing out. And the prompting that says, but maybe there's something different that you want from us at this time in this season. It's, it's in these, these moments that we have this struggle <laughs> between self and God, between our will and God's will. And so in this final statement here in chapter 4, James is calling us to live out verse 7 of chapter 4. Submit yourselves therefore to God. That's, that's our starting point. Okay, God, I'm just, I'm just submitting all this to you. And he's urging us to live out chapter 4, verse 10. that says, humble yourselves before God. Oh God, I know that I belong to you. It's not about me. God, let your will reign in me. And let your will reign in my relationship with my wife. Let your will reign in my relationship with my kids and my friends and this church. Oh God, so, so that in all that I do, that I, I know you. In all that I do, I see you. In all that I do, I get to walk in obedience to you. So that I can know the joy of that path that is straight. It's not easy, not pain free, not without trials. But the path that says, I have the joy of walking in the goodness of God. I'm going to invite the worship team back up here. And as I do, would you, would you just take a moment, a space right now. I, I imagined over the last few minutes there were things, schedules, plans that were, that were sitting on you, that, that you were just moving through. May, may this be a space in which you're saying, God, I recognize I just said yes, and I didn't actually say, what would you desire? And would you just bring those things before God and say, God, I, I want to say, if it's your will, if it's your will, God, I, I, want, I want to walk in your goodness. Why don't you just take a space right now before God?